I want to welcome you all to Exploring Science. Um, and I, I want to make this announcement, um, and I want you all to really listen to what we're saying. And so we're going to actually shut down the chat just for a few minutes, and I'm going to paste a message in here. Um, if you want to talk to someone, you can email uh, Richard Krauss at yale.edu. Um, and we will open the chat up for later in the event, but we really hope that you take a moment to listen to what we're saying and think about it first. So um, I wanna start by saying that science does not happen in a vacuum. Uh, those, there are those in our community who are hurting during this time of national outrage and protest against the killing of George Floyd and police brutality, especially those in the black community. And I want to let you all know that we see you and we at Exploring Science stand in solidarity with you. And this is an incredibly difficult time and we understand if science isn't the only thing on your mind during our presentations, that is completely understandable and totally all right. And please just know that science needs your voices and we need your ideas and we need more black indigenous people of color scientists. And it's on us to make science welcoming and accessible for all. Um, and it's on us to do that work. And so we at Exploring Science are making an effort to do that work and make that a reality for all scientists. And we really hope that you will join us in that journey. Thank you. Um, and so I just want you to know everyone here who's part of Exploring Science is um, supportive of this mission. And so if you need to talk to someone, please do so. And so we're going to continue our event. Um, and this is an event brought to you by Open Labs and the Flip Science Fair. So our first to talk, talk today will be by Nick. Uh, he's a graduate student in applied physics and will teach us how we can use quantum circuits to measure atoms. Our second talk today will be by Kostov. He's a graduate student in astronomy and will discuss how high school physics can be used to find black holes and dark matter. So thank you all for joining us um, and please enjoy our talks. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Frattini as Shannon just told you. And today uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about measurement and amplification at the quantum limit. So what I have on my screen over here and hopefully you can see uh, is a poster that I've been working on for you guys, uh, for y'all. And uh, today, um, I really want to uh, say that uh, I guess it, it takes a lot of people uh, to do this work and takes a lot of people on my journey uh, personally. Uh, and so um, I started out being uh, excited about physics and math in high school, went uh, to college to actually be an engineer. I saw we had a bunch of people interested in engineering uh, in the chat, so that's pretty cool. I myself am an electrical engineer. Uh, but then I wanted to apply that more toward physics, and so I joined uh, the Applied Physics Department here at uh, Yale to go ahead and try to put some of that engineering tools to use in the uh, in, in lab. So I do research, and specifically, I'm going to talk to you today about this word, quantum. So let's start there. So uh, quantum is the physics of and the study of what is on the very, very small. So if you can see my mouse here, if anybody wants to type in a chat, what do you think this is a picture of here? This one or this one, we have like sort of caricatures. All right, we got a lot of answers. Uh, a lot of atoms, uh, maybe how many ever, 100 people we have. I have 100 atoms in the chat. So you are all correct. This is, this is exactly an atom. And so to get an idea for how small an atom is, right, you may uh, think, okay, let's break it down. I have myself, right, I have my shirt, I have my body. Uh, and as you may have heard from some of the talks in previous weeks, your body is made up of cells, right? And those cells are made up of things like DNA and proteins and things you may have heard about. But all of those things themselves at an even smaller level are... Um, are made up of atoms, okay? And so our goal uh, in our field is to study what exactly is special about these atoms. And today we're gonna try to answer a, a rather simple question about how do I measure an atom? 
So what do I mean by measuring an atom? If I have an atom, you've got this picture of an electron going around the nucleus or the proton. So you have this negatively charged thing uh, and it's going around. And what we wanna ask uh, is be able to answer the question, at this point in time, is the electron on the right or on the left? And just from understanding how to go about uh, measuring that very simple question, we can start to learn things about the atom. We can start to put them together uh, and, and start to study slightly more complex things, like for instance, designing new materials. And eventually uh, we might be able to understand how to put atoms together for something that you may have heard of, which is called quantum computing, where we'll uh, try to harness that power to do something uh, cool. But okay, so the goal is to measure today it is, the, uh, is the electron on the left or the right of the atom. And to do that, I need to introduce you to some of the tools in our field. So uh, the tools of our field, which is called superconducting circuits, right? Where superconducting is going to be a type of wire that we're going to make. So what's a wire? Well, you might be familiar with wires, right? The computer that you're using right now has many, many, many wires inside of it. And uh, for instance, uh, you, you might have a lamp also or a light switch. You have wires in the walls uh, of the room that you're, you're sitting in probably. And when you turn on a light switch, what happens is electrons in that wire, they rush through to the light bulb and they go through and it starts to give off the light, right? So that sort of motion is very important and something we'd like uh, to, be, to understand. However, if we're going to use electronics or wires to try to measure an atom, we need to make sure that the information doesn't get lost along the way, right? And the problem with wires uh, in the wall, for instance, is that they're, they're sort of lossy. Like when you send an electron, it tends to slow down, right? It, it encounters something we like to call resistance, right? And it loses that information or that initial energy that it had. And if we're trying to measure something very sensitive, we can't have that happen. So instead of those normal wires that you use in the wall, we use something called superconducting wires, which are just precisely wires that have electrons that don't lose their energy along the way. So we have a special type of wire, okay? Special type of wire. Now, what are we gonna do? What, do, what shape are we gonna put this wire in? What kind of thing are we gonna make? Well, to do that, we're going to make something we call a harmonic oscillator. So to understand what a harmonic oscillator is here, I have two examples for you. One, which is simply a kid on a swing, and another we'll get to, which actually has to do with our electrons made of our special superconducting wires. So first, the kid on the swing. Now, maybe I hope you all uh, have um, <clears throat> met, uh, used a swing. It was one of my favorite um, uh, uh, things to do as a kid uh, on the playground. But if you uh, have a kid on the swing and you push them back and forth, back and forth, you know, they'll oscillate. They'll go back and forth like this, right? And if you were to take a stopwatch, okay? If you were to take a stopwatch when you pick them up and it go back and forth, you might have a swing that say takes one second for them to go back and forth. And then if it takes one second, I want you all to guess in the chat, how long will it take if I pull the kid twice as high up? So instead, of, if he was here and I let him go, it was one second. But if he was twice as high, how long would it take? I got a vote for two seconds, 1.75. We have a bunch of, bunch of votes here. Two second, one second, lots of things, okay? But what's really cool What's really cool about a harmonic oscillator is it's exactly one second, exactly. For that particular oscillator, for that particular kid on the swing, no matter how high they are, it's one second. And if you want, you can go ahead and test this after this talk. You can uh, tie something to a tree, for instance, and let it swing back and forth with a stopwatch. And you'll see that for that particular thing, no matter how high it is, it's the same amount of time every time. Right? And that's pretty cool. That's pretty powerful because it means with this one number, by measuring how fast somebody uh, goes back and forth on a swing, we can tell which oscillator we're dealing with. Okay? Now, for 
now, and that's going to be a powerful tool for us because we can make oscillators out of electrons. So we make a caricature, caricature of these things, which looks something like this, where we sort of have two metal pads given by these sort of plates, and then a thin sort of wire connecting them, which we sort of heuristically draw like this, okay? And what's going to happen is we have electrons that are going to slosh back and forth and back and forth from one pad to the other. And that sloshing back and forth, we can model with math as just exactly the same as we would model a kid on a swing. All right, so that mathematical model is very important, but moreover, we can still have a sort of stopwatch time for these electrons sloshing back and forth between these two pads, okay? And importantly, just like the kid on the swing, it doesn't matter how many electrons we have, we really just have one stopwatch, okay? So that's the key tool that we're going to need now to be able to measure our atoms. And I should say one thing that's very important is that the electronic version of this stopwatch that we have is very, very good. We're very good at having stopwatches for these electronic circuits. Okay, so now we have the main tool. How are we gonna go about, um, go about measuring the atom? What we're gonna do is we're gonna take one of our friends, the harmonic oscillator, Okay, and we're gonna stick an atom next to it. And we're gonna stick an atom next to it in such a way that if the electron is on the right side of the atom, then our harmonic oscillator would have one stopwatch time. And if it's on the left side of the atom, then we would have a different stopwatch time. And so now measuring something really cool about an, about an atom, like where is its electron, just boils down to measuring the stopwatch time of one of our harmonic oscillators. Okay, so we sort of reduced the problem and engineered it in a way that is, that is actually a simpler thing for us to do. But we have to be careful. I told you that atoms are very, very small, right? And, and so we can't make uh, the electrons slosh too much in this oscillator or they will break uh, our system, okay? And so uh, what we would have to do is just push the kid a little bit on the swing, just have a little bit of sloshing. But then with just a little bit of sloshing, it's really hard to make uh, an oscillate. It's really hard to make a measurement with your stopwatch. It's very hard. It's much easier if the sloshing is much, much higher. Okay? So what we're going to do, which is actually my job as a graduate student, is take the little bit of sloshing that we're going to do and make it bigger or amplify it. And my job is to design one of these amplifiers, which takes a small, back and forth and makes it much, much larger so that we can really, with our stopwatch, do a good job and measure whether the electron is on the left or the right, okay? So, okay, so now all I told you we need an amplifier and specifically we need an amplifier that operates in a way that uh, makes this sloshing go from large to small. And to do that, uh, we did something, um, we made, we used something called the snail. So uh, we took a bunch of these boxes, which I won't describe for you, which are again, special made out of metal. But the point is that we were able to use math and have a little fun and name something the snail and make a new type of object out of our circuits. And when we do that, uh, we can put it inside one of our friends, the harmonic oscillator in a thing that looks something like this. So on the right-hand side here, I actually have one of these snail objects. So you can sort of see one, two, three. These are these three boxes here and a smaller box here, this. And this picture is all something that's small, but we can make very well. So how small is it? Well, five microns is about half the width of one of your hairs, okay? So it's about half the width of one of your hairs, but we can control it and use techniques for uh, electric circuits like those of your computer uh, to go ahead and uh, to, to make this precisely. So what we do is we take one of our snails, we arrange a bunch of them in a row, we engineer how many we want, we put them inside a thing with our two big pads, so these are where the electrons are going to slosh back and forth, and we stick it in a box. So this box is about the size of a quarter, as you can see here, and we we'll attach some wires and we're going to measure it, okay? And we want to see, does this thing amplify, okay? So 
we want to do some experimental characterization. So we go ahead, take our little box, send an electrical signal, and we'll make the kid or the electrons slosh back and forth and give the stopwatch time. So on the right here, I've measured the stopwatch time for a few of these different devices. But the important part that we want is about amplification. And I promised you amplification, so I'm going to show it to you. Right? So how would we go about and get amplification? Well, actually, we can really go back to our kid on the swing. Okay? So if you have a kid on the swing, right, and they're going back and forth, back and forth, how would you get them to go higher? Right? How would you do that? Well, you might have a friend, for instance, give them a push. Right? You have to push them harder. Exactly. And so, um, but what's important, right, is you need to push them at the right time, right? So if the kid is going like this, you can't push him, push them, or you'll stop them, right? So you have to push them at the right time so that they always go higher and higher and you don't stop them. So for that, it's very important that you know the stopwatch time. Now, as a kid, you already are very good at understanding the stopwatch time of swings, so you don't need a number. But for us, we need a number so that I can type it in so I can send an electrical signal, right? So once I know that number, I can send what we call a strong pump, okay? Which is just a really large electrical signal that's correctly timed with our stopwatch. And then if we send a small signal in, it comes in, interacts with the pump, gets that push, so it's a small signal gets pushed bigger and bigger and comes out larger. And that's actually what you can see right here. This is actually a factor of 100 uh, getting larger. So now I've shown you that we indeed have something that can take a small signal and make it a factor of 100 larger. So really now we can go ahead and use this to measure the state of our atom. And with that, I'll thank you very much for paying attention. And uh, I'd like to take any questions. Hope you uh, enjoy it and uh, want to be a quantum engineer like me. Thank you. Awesome talk, Nick. Thank you. We have a couple of questions for you if you don't mind answering them. Of course. Cool. So we've collected these from the chat that people have been asking. So I'm just going to speak from the chat. So the first question or the first comment was about the size of atoms um, and it was about only being able to see them from a, a microscope. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, that's exactly right. So even a microscope is a little, there is not quite good enough usually. So you need very special microscopes in order to see atoms because they're really so small. So, so as we were saying, things you can see in microscopes actually for instance, this image here, what I was talking about, the half of a width of a human hair. This uh, is half the width of a human hair. But even this, this special microscope that I use, uh, you can't see individual atoms on this scale. So they're even another um, a factor of maybe a thousand smaller than that. So the atoms are really, really small. But we can make them interact by shining light uh, on them and having them uh, sort of pushing them. Uh, with light. So that's that's how we get around the size factor. Awesome. And then the next one was comparing the size of the harmonic oscillator. So how big is a harmonic oscillator if you put if you can put a single atom next to it? Good. So uh, so so there are many different um, types of harmonic oscillators that you can make. Um, the one that I'm showing you here, uh, is, um, is, is large. It's maybe half a millimeter. So, you know, you can actually see it with your eye. And actually, you can see this is a quarter right here. So this strip here is about this size. So you're right that an atom on this scale is extremely small. And what we do is we, we play some tricks that I don't have time uh, to talk to you about, about how we attach our atoms uh, to our harmonic oscillator that will uh, make it so even though the atom is really small, it can actually, uh, it has a very large influence over the stopwatch time of that oscillator. Awesome, thank you. And somebody said a spring bouncing back and forth is an oscillator. Yes, that's also a mechanical oscillator, if you will. Okay. 
many oscillators. Uh, what material is the superconductor? Uh, yes, oh, I, I definitely forgot to mention that, I'm sorry. Uh, the material that we use is aluminum. So just like, uh, for instance, if you have ever had aluminum foil to sort of, uh, I don't know, safe, uh, safeguard something uh, warm or to make something in the oven. Um, but the, uh, what's, what's important uh, is in order to make something superconducting, you usually have to cool it down to very, very co cold temperatures. Um, so in our case, we use uh, liquid helium to uh, cool things down. So you can imagine having basically a, a vat of very, very cold liquid that you're dunking your aluminum in. And once you dunk it in, it be becomes a uh, superconductor. Awesome. Next question, where do you work now and how long does it take for you to get that job? Um, right now, I'm a graduate student at Yale. So um, my, my work with, is research. So even though I'm a student, I actually get paid to be a student uh, as a scientist, which is pretty cool. Um, and so right now I'm doing my research uh, for the remainder of my PhD. Uh, so I've been doing this for about a few years now, I guess. I won't tell you how many, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, you can start doing this type of research after your undergrad. Uh, so I did high school uh, in California and then went to uh, uh, school again in California for my undergrad in Cal Berkeley, and now I am here. But even out of undergrad, you could do uh, research. I just really wanted to delve into these particular circuits, so that's why I came here. Awesome. And... Some follow-up questions for this aluminum superconductor. Why do you use aluminum? Um, why does it have to be cooled down so much? Uh, yeah, so the, the cold was what I uh, tried to say, that if it's warm, it's gonna be just like one of these normal uh, metals that, that um, it resists the electron flow. Why we use uh, aluminum is uh, actually a very deep and, and good question. Um, there are actually many, many, many types of superconductors. So many of the elements on the periodic table uh, give you superconductivity. Other common ones, for instance, are uh, niobium. Helium itself can be a, a superconductor. Um, uh, the reason for aluminum is something specific to these boxes, uh, which are little sandwiches of aluminum. So they're aluminum and then uh, aluminum oxide, which doesn't allow um, electrons to flow through, and then aluminum. And it turns out that that is very, um, a very good sandwich to have, I guess. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nick. I think we're going to move to the breakout room so we can talk in smaller groups and ask more questions about your presentation. Sounds good. Thank you very much for listening. Okay. Um, can you all see my slides? Great. <clears throat> So uh, before I begin, I'd really like to thank the organizers for organizing these uh, set of talks um, in, in the middle of a trying time and uh, despite all odds. So uh, hats off to everyone working for it. And I'd specifically like to thank uh, Joseph and Matt and uh, Victor for their very useful feedbacks um, after listening to my practice talk. So thank you guys. Uh, so hi. I'm Gustav. Uh, I'm a second year graduate student uh, in the astronomy department at Yale, and I work primarily on galaxies and how galaxies interact and, and cosmology, which is the study of the universe as a whole. Uh, what I'd like to talk today is uh, somewhat different, but definitely related. So uh, this picture in the, in the right of a, of a scholarly squirrel and this thing, uh, book of useless information, this, uh, this is just to set the context uh, of, of the story behind why I chose to talk on this topic. And it's because when I was in high school, I was always fascinated by physics and I could relate different aspects of physics which are um, more uh, connected to engineering, I could relate those things to practical applications. 
However, there are different aspects in physics which seem to me uh, very mathematical and abstract kind of. And I always used to wonder who uses these mathematical abstract things in physics in their work or in their day-to-day -day life. Turns out astrophysicists do, and in fact, quite a lot. So there are many, many examples where astrophysicists have used uh, very simple, basic physics principles uh, to, to go and discover uh, phenomenal uh, discoveries in the field of astrophysics, which, which completely changed the field itself. One such example, which I'm gonna talk about today is the confirmation of a black hole at the center of our galaxy. And I apologize to everyone. Um, I previously had planned to talk about dark matter as well, which was advertised, but then I decided it's better to uncover a little than to cover a lot. So I'm just gonna focus on black holes today. So we'll start with nothing but Newton's law of gravitation. And it's a simple law. It's always there in high school physics and probably all of you will encounter this at some point in high school. So this story, though probably not very accurate, is, is a really fun story. Um, mid 1600s, Sir Isaac Newton was sitting under an apple tree and he had a fantastic revelation. Um, he postulated that everything in the universe, every single object, no matter how big or small, are attracting each other by a force of gravitation, which is proportional to the mass, uh, to the product of the masses, so mass one times mass two, divided by the square of the distance between the two objects. Now, this simple law could not only uh, explain how apple would fall to the ground, but could equally well and very accurately predict how planets should be moving around stars. And this universality that you have a simple law that can explain the motion of everything from baseball to, to Elon Musk's SpaceX satellite or, or um, a space launch or everything. You could explain every motion with just this simple law that is probably the most um, fascinating thing about the law of gravitation. Now, one key thing that I'd like you to take away from this is that using Newton's law, you can connect these three uh, features of planetary orbits. So the orbital time period, that is the time period that is taken by a planet to go around the sun once, the size of the orbit and the mass of the central body, here the sun, these three can be connected uh, using Newton's law of gravitation. And if you happen to know any two, then you can exactly calculate what the third should be. So for example, if you know the orbital period and if you know the, the, the size of the orbit, you can actually calculate what the mass of the sun should be. Now let's move on from uh, mid 1600s to, to 21st century. So this, this is a video uh, made by the American Museum of Natural History uh, to show that we are no longer stuck uh, trying to understand the motion of planets, but we have kind of actually uh, delved into a deeper understanding of our local patch of the universe. So we'll start from the from the earth and we'll gradually zoom out. So here are all the green orbits that are being shown are the orbits of different artificial satellites. Um, those that are responsible for GPS, for telecommunication and everything in modern life actually. So you can think of this video as if a spaceship is launching and it's moving farther and farther away from Earth. Now this red 
line that you see over here is the orbit of the moon around Earth. And this is the orbit of Earth going around sun. And as you go farther away, you gradually get to see the different orbits of different planets. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Sorry, Pluto, you are no longer a planet. And if you go far enough, you realize that the sun appeared bright to you just because it was very close to you. Going far enough, one realizes that sun is a very average star having a very average brightness. It's, sun is just like any other star uh, in our galaxy. And going even farther away, you get to see the tens of billions of stars um, that make up the entire spiral disky structure of our galaxy that we call the Milky Way. So, so this is fairly uh, the representation of our current understanding of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And we are over here, uh, kind of not at the center, not at the very outskirts, somewhere in between. And obviously we can't have this face on picture of Milky Way because we are living in the disk. So when we look at Milky Way, uh, it's, it's more like this. And you can actually see this. You can actually see this spectacular view of Milky Way if you go to a very remote area, uh, far from city lights, far from light pollution. Uh, this is actually visible. So this, this is actually the Keck telescopes um, near Monarchia in Hawaii, uh, looking at the center of Milky Way. So we're here and looking directly towards the galactic center. And this observation by the Keck telescopes went on for more than uh, two decades, about two and a half decades. And what they were observing are a bunch of stars at the very center of our galaxy. Now, what I'll show now are a series of uh, snapshots taken over different years. So this is this started in middle of 1995 and went up to the end of last year, actually. 2019. So these circles are the actual observed positions of different stars at the center of our galaxy. And this star shape over here is really nothing. Uh, you can't see anything over there. It's, uh, this star is just put by hand to, to mark a central position and you will soon understand the reason. So I'll go through the different snapshots um, of observation over the years. So as time progresses, you see that these stars are not stationary. They are actually moving. And they are in fact all orbiting around this central region. So there is something over here around which these stars at the center of our galaxy are moving, are orbiting, but you can't really see anything over, uh, over here at the center. So it's like having a planetary system where you can see the planets going on in circular orbits, but you, you could, couldn't see the sun at the center. That would be very weird. So you'd know there is something at the center around which things are going, but you can't see anything over there. But, as I had mentioned in the very first slide, these three things are related. The orbital time period, the size of the orbit, and the mass of the central object. And if you know any two, you can calculate the third. So now, using this observation, one can use the orbital period and the size of the orbit to get the mass of the hidden central object. So can you guys guess uh, which you think would it be? So would it be much lighter than a star or similar to mass of a sun or a lot heavier than the sun? Okay, I, I see a lot, lot of C. Uh, right, and everyone is correct over here. It is expected to be a lot heavier because uh, it is massive enough to, to make, the, uh, make the stars go around it why 
uh, while the thing itself is not moving at all. So it's, it's such a massive object that's, that the pull, the gravitational pull is so strong that stars are orbiting it, but the thing is so massive that it's not budging from its own place. It, it's, it's staying put uh, where it was. And you can actually calculate its mass and it is a lot heavier than the mass of a star. So it turns out if you calculate it, it's about 4 million times the mass of the sun. Now, what could that possibly be? And everyone knows the answer over here. The spoiler is all, already in the slides. So yes, it is indeed a black hole and it is a black hole 4 million times the mass of an average star. Now, Albert Einstein's theory in early 1900s was actually used to predict that these exotic objects called black holes could actually exist. And you can think of it this way. Say if you take the sun and take the entire mass of the sun and just just squeeze it to a smaller and smaller volume. If you could somehow put the entire mass of the sun to a volume comparable to say Manhattan, then the density would be so large and its gravitational force will be so large that from its surface, even light can't escape. And that would become a black hole. And in fact, most massive stars at the end of their life cycle uh, do get compressed because of their own gravity and do become black holes. And this would explain why you could fit 4 million times the mass of a, of a star in a tiny volume over there around which other stars are orbiting. Black hole is the only explanation uh, for such a high density. Also, this would explain why you can't see anything over there. So it's, there's, there's something over there which is extremely massive, but you can't see anything. So black hole is the only natural explanation uh, of that phenomenon. So Milky Way does have a supermassive black hole at its center. Now, what would it look like if you went very close to it? It would look very similar to, to Gargantua. And uh, thank you, Shannon, for, for sharing this uh, image already. Uh, this is actually a very fascinating image. And as Shannon already mentioned, this is actually created by physicists uh, using our best understanding of what Milky Way's black hole should actually look like. So this was Christopher Nolan's imagination in 2014. Now it's 2020. We no longer have to rely on Christopher Nolan's imagination to see how a black hole actually looks like. Because for the last few years, even Horizon Telescope has been working. And it is actually a combination of some of the best radio telescopes all over the world. And in terms of pure resolution, it is the most powerful telescope that human beings have ever built. Even Horizon Telescope is its resolution is so powerful that it can resolve an apple on the surface of the moon. So that says something about its resolving power. And thanks to this, we had the most popular science image of 2019, uh, which completely flooded the internet and social media and news outlets uh, in the middle of last year and bored everyone to death by its repeated uh, appearance over a week or so. So this is actually the image uh, of a supermassive black hole, actually more massive than the black hole of, of Milky Way. It's a supermassive black hole in a neighboring galaxy, M87. And this glowing thing, this yellowish orangish glowing thing around it is actually the hot gas. Um, circulating around uh, the supermassive black hole. So you can think of it as a, as a silhouette or a shadow of the black hole. Now, despite its fantastic resolution, this is a pretty blurred image. Uh, what scientists expect 
the phenomena to be actually looking like is more like this, when hot gas actually flows around uh, supermassive black holes. And this is in fact the first and up to now the only image of black holes that we have. Now this is M87's black hole, a neighboring galaxy. When are we gonna get the image of our own black hole, of the black hole at the center of Milky Way? Turns out, Event Horizon Telescope is actually working on it right now as we speak. And uh, it's probably going to be a few years, but we are soon going to see uh, the image, a similar image probably, of, of the black hole at the center of Milky Way. So I just like to end with saying uh, what a fantastic time it is to be a, a high school student or, or a, even an undergrad or a graduate student uh, when taking an actual photograph of a black hole is no longer science fiction. But apart from that, we should also remember that even before Event Horizon Telescope came into the picture, we had actually gone uh, pretty far. We had not only predicted that a supermassive black hole should exist at the center of our own galaxy, but we had also calculated its mass based on nothing but a simple equation from high school textbooks. Uh, thank you. Great talk, Austin. All right, we've got a few uh, more quick questions that we'll ask you to answer here. Um, for everybody else, we are going to try to have um, Kostov answer more questions. We're going to do an interview afterwards and send the video of that interview out to everybody um, after the fact, so cost a little bit more time to answer some more of the more involved cosmological questions that you all brought up. Um, but we will have a, some closing statements by Rick after this too, so we want to make time for that and make sure we don't keep you all too long. Um, so for cost of, um, there was a lot, of, a lot of chatter going on about Pluto when it very briefly came up, made a cameo appearance, and it lit everybody's attention. Um, do you, could you comment briefly about uh, why Pluto's planet status was revoked quite a while yeah. ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's a very good question. And uh, I myself was not actually very sure when that actually happened. And uh, I, was, I was actually very saddened to, to hear the news that Pluto is no longer a planet. I somehow always was fascinated by Pluto. Uh, but, uh, but turns out uh, Pluto, when it was initially discovered, uh, we only had, uh, only had Pluto in that category of objects uh, rotating around the sun. But now Pluto is actually a dwarf planet uh, and there are lots of similar rocky structures, uh, similar rocky spheres going around uh, the sun, which should also be classified as planets if Pluto is classified as planet. And I do not uh, want to remember thousands of names of planets. I want to count my planets in my solar system on my hand. And hence we have to unfortunately exclude those thousands of objects that have later been discovered. And hence, categorically, Pluto falls in their category. So yeah. Thanks for that. Um, and then we'll do one more sort of, sort of quicker question. Um, what, what makes up a black hole? What is, what is it like on the inside? Can you speak to that? Yep, uh, this is a billion dollar question or a trillion dollar question perhaps, because no one really knows. Uh, even Kip Thorne, uh, who is a recent Nobel laureate in physics, who actually uh, did help uh, create the images and simulations in interstellar. Uh, when it comes to interior of black hole, Kip Thorne also said, man, I really don't know. Go ahead and use your imagination, Christopher Nolan. Do whatever you like when the person falls inside a black hole. I don't care. So what goes on inside the event horizon, which is the kind of an outer um, region of a black hole, what goes on inside the event horizon of a black hole, no one really knows. And that's where even Einstein's theory kind of breaks down. And 
people are researching on it. That's a constant field of research in theoretical physics. And hopefully some of you uh, will get to answer that someday. <laughs>